I'm Daniel Engelman from Bay State Medical Center in Springfield, Massachusetts, and I'm also president of the ERAS Cardiac International Surgical Society. And today we're going to be discussing ERAS and all its components. This is part one of two videos in which we are going to discuss the background to ERAS, what it is, and what we're looking at. And we're also going to discuss some of the preoperative components that make up an ERAS cardiac program. I have a panel of experts here who will introduce themselves. So I'm Rakesh Arora from Winnipeg, Manitoba, the St. Boniface Cardiac Surgery Program. My name is Ed Boyle from Bend, Oregon. Kevin Lobdell, Atrium Health in Charlotte, North Carolina. So just to get us started, I'm going to go right to the beginning of uh, enhanced recovery, and I'm going to ask uh, Ed if you can describe really what is ERAS? What does it even stand for, uh, and uh, why was an ERAS society formed? Yeah, ERAS stands for Enhanced Recovery After Surgery, and it's a, a, an organization that goes back a number of years uh, that really was most uh, prominent in some of the other surgical fields like general surgery, um, and as, as well as in thoracic surgery, uh, but is somewhat new to cardiac surgery. And the idea is to pull together enhanced recovery protocols that are evidence-based, and then bring together like-minded people that want to work together on enhancing perioperative recovery. And so uh, several years ago, a group of people that were interested in ERAS um, and trying to see how this might uh, develop and evolve in cardiac surgery came together. So Rakesh, what were some of the challenges that you felt uh, getting this group together? So I think with, well, the group getting together was the easy part. I think we all had a great deal of engagement and recognized a similar problem. And I think that's one thing that's really lovely about these guys is that we've all had sort of the same epiphany, it seems, at the same time. The bigger challenge is trying to engage everyone else. And I think we've been doing the same way of preoperative evaluation, intraoperative management, and postoperative care for a number of years, even decades, in the same fashion. And trying to develop new paradigms and justifying why it's necessary is probably one of the major challenges. Then two, trying to figure out who we want to have those conversations with to start the process and start the ball rolling down a different, me different methodology, really. I don't know if you guys would agree or disagree with that. Agreed. And Kevin, what members of the team would you say you need to engage uh, when you're starting an ERAS program? Good question. I think that uh, the ERAS effort is um, synchronized with a lot of the current efforts like heart team approach or multidisciplinary care, all phases of care. So really what we're looking at doing is examining all of those things that we do, everything from pre-op or even prehabilitation through the operative phase, which historically has been the emphasis of surgeons, but then on to the ICU, uh, post-ICU care within the acute care facility and even continuing care, which we know is incredibly important uh, with respect to quality of outcomes, including things like readmission costs. So again, I think including all the team members with focus on improving um, as it would relate to the quality and value of care has been the uh, essence of ERAS. Uh, you know, just on that, the value again, has been largely focused on a provider value, and I think part of what ERAS is looking at is looking more at a patient and caregiver value lens as well, which is part of this process. I think that perhaps we've not done a great job in the past, and what this process can help facilitate. What's in it for a hospital, uh, Kevin, to start an ERAS program? I mean, why should they do it? Well, I think that uh, these may be labeled in different ways, but the advantage of ERAS is it's been around a decade plus in the general surgical world, so it's familiar with people. Often there'll be a dedicated ERAS coordinator, um, and they're working with the team to improve quality. There will be measurable things in the terms of quality or financials, oftentimes uh, things like length of stay readmission. Um, and those are the drivers of healthcare now. As we move towards healthcare systems having to bear risk, for the care that they deliver, these uh, efforts are uh, perfectly in sync with that. But also, like, like Rakesh was saying, expanding that beyond just the hospital stay to the full continuum of recovery, which is really what's most important to the patients, you know, not only how quickly they get out of the hospital, but how complete and how rapid they can get back to the best possible recovery they can get. That's right. I think a great example would be our interest in the patient reported outcome measures, which I think we're on the vanguard. It's difficult because anytime we're trying to collect longitudinal data, there's always the challenge of actually getting it and making sense of it. But 
I think we're well positioned to lead those efforts. So Ed, uh, the ERAS Society is uh, writing uh, expert consensus guidelines and uh, my question would be what process was used to generate these guidelines and also how were conflicts of interest uh, handled? So um, when the first group came together and said that you know there was a, a group of people identified that they were interested, the next step was where do we go next? And the concept was, well, why don't we start by doing a very rigorous and um, structured evidence-based analysis of what's out there that's been published or what is expert opinion. So the first thing we did is put the word out to try to select a group of experts. And this was done uh, in a fashion kind of following the Institute of Medicine's uh, processes on how to do this and um, working with the ERAS International Group, working with uh, folks um, through some of the societies and such, a, a group of um, doctors came together and said, let's hold a first meeting that was a public meeting that was open to um, uh, folks that were cardiac surgeons, but also cardiac anesthesia, critical care, nursing, physician assistants. And we said, well, what are the, the subjects that would be, uh, should be considered for this? After that public meeting, we came out with a long list of ideas and then formed the expert group, some of who actually just came through that public meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, because uh, you know, they were interested in this, they were identified experts. And, uh, and then we narrowed it down to, I think, 22 or 23 subjects. Um, the, then the next piece was to say, OK, who should be the subject matter champions that are going to help pull together the questions, the literature? Uh, conflicts of interest were managed, uh, like I said, with the Institute of Medicine um, standards where they were identified. Um, and then manage by uh, making sure that people that had potential conflicts uh, were excluded from those discussions and such. Um, then the subject matter champions helped put together the search words uh, for an extensive literature search, uh, which was done. The, the populated um, uh, 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 files were all bought in, brought in so that we could electronically get all these um, articles. And then everybody took the time to read them. Several meetings were held to, dis held to discuss them. And ultimately, uh, there was a voting process uh, that, would, again, was based on um, sort of the principles or, or language uh, suggested by the ACC, AHA, and the STS, a um, AATS uh, written publications about how to select language when you're doing this sort of thing, whether it was uh, the strength of the recommendation, um, and then the level of evidence. So a voting process was undertaken and then ultimately came up with, again, I think 22 or 23 um, uh, uh, recommendations uh, that were divided into preoperative, interoperative, and postoperative interventions. Which is a perfect segue into sort of changing the topic here now and let's talk about some of the preoperative uh, recommendations uh, and how uh, they affect uh, our patient care. Um, I'd like to turn to you, Rakesh, and uh, discuss what you think are the mo key components to a, uh, the uh, preoperative uh, ERAS. Right, so what we've learned from the non-cardiac groups who've done ERAS is really trying to find opportunities to optimize those vulnerable patients who may not succeed after a, a you know, big operation. Things such as frailty, malnutrition, glucose optimization, and um, uh, cognitive and um, mood disorder type dis um, issues are also things that can be optimized preoperatively. We couldn't focus on all of those for these first guidelines. I think one of the tasks we had was really deciding which of the 23 of the it was a multitude list of lists yeah. we had narrowed down to. So the ones we really focused on primarily was on better risk identification to some degree, preoperative uh, rehabilitation or prehab, and then glucose uh, optimization as well were the ones that we kind of really focused on to start with. So if we're talking about prehabilitation, uh, we're actually suggesting potentially uh, optimizing elective patients prior to cardiac surgery, mm -hmm. which theoretically might delay uh, their getting into the operating room. Now, these are elective patients. They probably could wait a little bit longer, but cardiac surgeons are not used to um, delaying their elective cases. They put them in the first available slot. So I guess I would ask you, uh, Kevin, whether you would consider delaying elective cardiac surgery to perform prehabilitation and optimize patients prior to surgery, assuming the data supported that there were benefits postoperatively, would you consider this a good practice or would you consider it uh, disruptive? Yeah, it's a good question and I think you touch on the key issues there. Um, speaking generically, I think the exercise is to quantify risk and then to mitigate risk in a way that's evidence-based. An example 
um, could be something as simple as when do you uh, hold antiplatelet agents, right, to optimize the uh, success for graft patency, reduce the risk of perioperative hemorrhage, transfusion, that sort of thing, even retain blood, which we touch on in uh, our efforts. That said, um, I would say we're early in the process of fully understanding all of those opportunities in the rehabilitation. The one that's probably the most attractive, Rakesh talked about or touched on, was frailty. So if we think about gait speed and we think about grip strength, some of the things that we can do to measure or you know, any experienced surgeon could look at somebody and say they're frail. We know that their risk is maybe two to three times the equal but non-frail patient. So then the question ends up being what do we do to mitigate that risk? And I think that maybe that's a good segue for Rakesh to opine a little bit. He's fortunate that he comes from Canada, has a lot of research experience, and I think their system is set up in a way that maybe embraces that a little bit more than we do in the U.S. Well, yeah, so in Canada, we do have wait lists prior to surgery, and there's an opportunity, therefore, to use that waiting period to optimize patients, and that's where the prehab program for us has been very attractive. Using that period of time where patients often just wait around in fear before their surgery and don't do anything, and then get worse, particularly if they're frail, to become more deconditioned. So finding opportunities for nutrition and exercise and mood therapies preoperatively to reduce anxiety, depression, are all things I think that are probably of value. But to answer your question specifically, should we delay? We've shown, I think, and others have shown that you can do these programs safely without causing harm. That's I an important point. And I don't, first I don't know that we should be necessarily intentionally delaying people yet. I think we're doing those randomized trials now. Time will tell us, I think. And I think we need to do more of that kind of investigation. I think a lot of what we learned through this process is that the level of evidence needs to be more robust to help inform our practices. And prehab is one of those for cardiac surgery in particular, I think. And I think one of the things that you touch on too is not only if you should do it, but then what do you do? Right. And there could be sort of a generic approach, but also something that's tailored yeah. to a specific patient because just like their maladies, um, these associated issues with frailty may uh, require very uh, precise, specific uh, efforts for them as opposed to just everybody gets the same thing. To change gears just ever so slightly, still discussing the pre-operative time frame, you know, the opioid crisis is, is, a, is a major problem. Is there any role for uh, trying to decrease uh, opioid utilization with some pre-operative interventions, education? Uh, any of you pine in on that particular area? Well, one of the things that was discussed by the group was how maybe more could be done to prepare people for what to expect in terms of pain and what's, what's a, um, a manageable and what to expect about how they're going to be treated with it. And there are some studies that show that if you help set those expectations, um, sometimes people report less pain afterwards. So maybe that's the first step in helping look at ways to um, decrease uh, opioid problems in that perioperative period. Sure. And my last question involves uh, preoperative uh, carbohydrate slash diets. It, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's been shown in all the other ERAS societies that if you give somebody a carbohydrate shake, uh, there are some benefits and uh, there are um, potentials in the cardiac arena. Um, do any of you have a, a feeling about that? I would say it's, it's unclear at this point. There's certainly, as you say, the precedent, which is valuable. Some of the challenges relate to how perioperative uh, glucoses are controlled, right? There's a variety of different ways. In addition, we may have some unique uh, challenges in that we have patients that often will have multiple tubes, including transesophageal echocardiogram, and um, it's unclear exactly how all of these pieces of what we do are gonna fit together to provide somebody a high quality and a high reliable outcome, i.e. Uh, many surgeons would be fearful, I think, of things like aspiration, and rightly so. So I think we're trying to figure those things out. But I do think that brings up a great point, like mm -hmm. you, you said, which is cardiac surgery is different than general surgery. And so what are those unique things? In the general surgery literature, you know, they're, they're saying you can uh, have clear liquids up to two to four hours before the operation. You, can, you should have a glucose um, drink in preparation for the operation mm -hmm. uh, within, what, two to four hours, right, before the operation. 
And so that led to a lot of discussion, like, you know, is that, is that good for cardiac surgery population? How do you make that practical within the workflows? And like I think you mentioned, there's a lot more data coming out um, uh, right, you know, very soon, mm -hmm. which I think are going to answer those questions. Great. That's terrific. And I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us. This is uh, part one of a two-part series on uh, enhanced recovery after surgery. Uh, part two will discuss intraoperative and postoperative uh, interventions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you.